online and here to the new this new session of the cross alps logic seminars so today we have the pleasure to have gabriel goldberg from uc berkeley so he had this he did his phd he started his, uh, in harvard he, he just finished two years ago but he's already well known in the theory his thesis has won has been awarded the sex prize for uh, out, outstanding dissertation in mathematical logic he has been a plenary speaker in the european satellite conference but now he's in berkeley so today he's going to talk to us about the optimality of Uzuba's theorem please thank you Vincenzo. Thanks for inviting me to speak here. Um, uh, so let me just say what I'm going to talk about. So uh, I included um, lots of background, probably too much background for the talk. And and my excuse, the reason is that I misread uh, Vincenzo's email inviting me to speak here. Uh, he said that there would be people with a background in computability theory and somehow I thought that he said that there would be computer science students. So I'm going to tell you what the ordinals are and what the cardinals are. Wow. And so Ben DeBonk left the meeting uh, for that reason. Okay. Anyway, um, are you recording me, by the way? Yes, we are. Okay. So I'll be careful what I say. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about something called set theoretic geology, uh, which is um, field sub 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 field uh initiated by hampkins and uh reitz um it has to do with the you know foundations of the theory of forcing um and then usuba's theorem is one of the the main uh results that's come out of that field and i'm going to talk about a theorem i recently proved that answered um one of Usuba's uh, questions, uh, the, the main question in his paper where he proves this theorem. Uh, and then I'll sort of, I'll talk about Wooden's Hodge conjecture, elementary embeddings and their relationship with Usuba's theorem. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, let, let me like just get through all this, these background slides that I've written, I think I'm going to go pretty quickly through them. So first, the continuum hypothesis, in case you've forgotten. So here are the cardinals. Um, something that's annoying about the cardinals is that Aleph zero, uh, well, it really should have been zero, but instead Aleph zero is the first infinite cardinal. It has always bothered me anyway. They're indexed by ordinals. The ordinals are stages of transfinite inductive processes. Okay, each set has a cardinality. The cardinalities of infinite sets are transfinite cardinals. So the cardinality of the natural numbers is out zero. Uh, the cardinality of the real numbers is not clear. It has to be aleph alpha for some alpha, but the question of which alpha is Cantor's continuum problem. And the continuum hypothesis says that uh, it's Aleph 1. Uh, it can't be Aleph Omega. So uh, Aleph 1 is the smallest thing it could possibly be, the smallest uncountable cardinality of the set. Um, the, the most important structure in set theory, sort of, is the universe of sets. That's, that's the, I don't know, the arena in which set theory takes place. Uh, so the cumulative hierarchy is, is given by iterating the power set. So this is an example of how ordinals play the role of uh, stages of a transfinite inductive process. So you just define V0 to be the empty set, and then you iterate the power set starting there. So V1 is the power set of the empty set, which is just the set that contains the empty set. Uh, and V2 is the power set of that, and so on. Uh, for limit ordinals, which are the ordinals that are not of the form alpha plus one. Uh, you just take the unions of what you've built so far. And then finally, uh, the universe of sets is the class V, 
It's the union of all of the alphas. Um, and, you know, ZF is, is the theory uh, of V. Um, so it's a, it's a theory in the language of set theory, which just has one symbol, it represents membership. And it says enough uh, to prove that every set belongs to some stage of the cumulative hierarchy. Uh, the, the generalized continuum hypothesis, I guess, states that for all ordinals alpha, um, the alpha -th infinite level of the cumulative hierarchy has cardinality, the alpha -th infinite cardinal. So that says there are you know, no cardinals that arise in, in the cumulative um, hierarchy except by iterating the power set. Um, okay. So CH, the reason it's generalized is that CH is equivalent to the case that alpha is equal to one. Oh, by the way, you can watch uh, dawn taking place behind me because it's 7, 10 a.m. in California. Um, so a model of set theory, uh, well, it's a family of sets that's, that's closed under uh, the basic set theoretic operations. The point is that uh, set theory or uh, zermelo frankel set theory basically just asserts that um, the, the universe is closed under various operations like the power set operation, uh, that's the power set axiom or unordered pairs, it's the pairing axiom and definable subsets is the separation axiom. So a model of set theory will satisfy pairing if it's closed under the operation that takes two elements of the model to the unordered pair of them. I'll satisfy the separation axiom if whenever you have a set in the model and a definable uh, subset of the model, their intersection belongs to the model. So this def thing is the family of sets definable over M from parameters in M. And the constructible hierarchy is, um, well, it's built in order to you're trying to build minimum or minimal models of uh, ZF. So by the separation axiom tells you that they have to be closed under uh, definability. So all you do is iterate the definability operator uh, transfinitely. So you start with the empty set again, and instead of iterating the power set like you do in the definition of the cumulative hierarchy, you just uh, at each stage take all the definable from parameters subsets of the structure you've built so far. So definable in the language of set theory. So if you have a model of set theory and its height, um, meaning the, the supremum of the ordinals in the model uh, is beta, then L beta, so the beta level of the constructible hierarchy is contained in that model and the ordinal height of L beta is always going to be beta. Um, and also L beta is a model of set theory in this case. So it, it uh, satisfies all the ZF axioms. And so the, the point of this uh, observation is just that, um, you know, for any beta, L beta is the minimum model of set theory with ordinal height beta, if there is a model of set theory of that height. That's what this is saying. Um, so it's a, a canonical model of ordinal height beta. It's sort of actually surprising that there is a minimum model of set theory because the, the axioms of set theory are not universal. They're not, you know, downwards absolute. So there's no reason to expect the existence of a minimum model. If you intersect all these models, why, why should it also satisfy the axioms of set theory? So it's a, a little bit of a surprise. Um, and then the empirical fact about the constructible hierarchy, which makes it interesting, is that um, any question you ask about these structures, at least about the, the first order properties about these structures can be answered. So for example, any L beta is a model of the axiom of choice and a model of the generalized continuum hypothesis. So um, this is, uh, I mean, this was a, the original reason why uh, Gödel constructed these um, these models, the 
constructible hierarchy and the constructible universe uh, was to prove that there are models that satisfy the generalized continuum hypothesis and there are models that satisfy the axiom of choice. Um, so the, the important part of this is that you can prove that L beta satisfies the axiom of choice without assuming the axiom of choice. So this gives the consistency of, um, of those theories, just assuming the consistency of ZF. Okay, so what about models though that, that aren't canonical? So uh, the constructible universe is the, the union of all the levels of the constructible hierarchy. And um, the immediate question, uh, given the definition of V, so the, the union of the cumulative hierarchy and the definition of L is the union of the constructible hierarchy. You can ask whether V is equal to L. Um, and in ZF, since every set is an element of V, uh, the question becomes, is every set uh, constructible? So an element of some level of the constructible hierarchy. Now, uh, since the structures L alpha satisfy V is equal to L, and uh, presumably some of them can be models of set theory. Um, sorry, have we lost uh, Vincenzo? I'm getting an error for uh, for Manilo Valenti. Oh, you're back. Um, is my internet cutting out or something? Wait, uh, no, I we can hear you really well. There's, okay. there's no, no problem. Okay. Yeah, everything was fine here. Okay, sorry. Um, well, let me continue. So uh, since the, the structures L alpha satisfy ZFC or, or ZF plus V is equal to L, you can't refute V is equal to L and ZF because uh, the, the existence of a model of the theory implies the consistency of ZF plus V is equal to L. But in the early 60s, it was um, not known how to build a model that doesn't satisfy V is equal to L. Uh, so it was conceivable, though uh, extremely, I think it seemed extremely unlikely that, that V is equal to L uh, was a theorem of ZF. That would have been a very amazing thing because it, that, it would imply that ZF implies the generalized continuum hypothesis and the axiom of choice. And it just tells you everything you could ever want to know about sets. The, the theory ZF plus V is equal to L uh, is very powerful. It can answer every set theoretic question, basically. Um, so anyway, to, to, refute, uh, to refute that ZF proves V is equal to L, you need to find a model of set theory that's not one of these canonical models L alpha. And this was first accomplished by Cohen in 1964 uh, by the method of forcing. Well, sort of first accomplished by Cohen. So we'll talk about um, a theorem that predates Cohen's theorem that um, is due to Scott that actually already shows the, the consistency of V not being equal to L, but it's a, it's a bit of a different approach and it's not quite as definitive of a result. Anyway, um, so the, what the forcing technique allows you to do is add in new sets to a given model of set theory. So you're given a model of set theory M and, and uh, by forcing you can add to it uh, or at least simulate adding to it a generic set G. Uh, this gives you something called a generic extension of the model M, and it's denoted by M square brackets G. Uh, so it's, it's just the smallest model of set theory that has M and G in it. Um, so, so in general, if you just try to add an arbitrary set into a model M, you can always build the smallest, I don't know, model set theory that contains it, but uh, but the problem is that um, in, in general, that, that won't, uh, won't necessarily preserve the ordinals of the model you started with. Um, if you add in a generic set though, then since there's in a sense, very little information about the generic set uh, encoded into N, 
uh, the, the generic doesn't um, encode well orderings that are not already in M. Uh, so, so the point of generic sets, if you don't know this, is, is that somehow by being M has so little information about a generic set that it somehow knows everything about it and can you can sort of treat the generic as if it's inside of M. I don't know, it's, it's sort of bizarre, uh, but extremely powerful technique. Okay, so anyway, this gives you a model that's not an L alpha because um, you know, if you look at the ordinal height of M, uh, it's the same as the ordinal height of M of G. Uh, and M of G is a proper extension of M because these generic sets G can never be in the model M. Uh, and so that means it's a proper extension of uh, L beta. Uh, and so in particular, M of G is a model of set theory of height beta, and it can't be L alpha for alpha not equal to beta. And it can't be L beta because it's a proper extension of L beta. So it's, it's not any of the L alphas. So the the thing the point here though is you know if you, if you try to build the smallest model of set theory containing m in an arbitrary set it could be that uh, you need to add new ordinals above m and uh, that might, you might add so many ordinals that actually you, you do just get one of the l alphas so it's it's very important that you added one of these generic sets okay so the first major application of forcing was to to build models where AC is false and models where uh, CH is true and AC, I, I mean, CH is false, but AC is true. So um, so putting together Gödel's results on the constructible hierarchy and Cohen's results uh, from forcing, you get the, the independence of uh, the axiom of choice from ZF and the independence of the generalized continuum hypothesis from ZF plus AC. Uh, or uh, CFC, it's Sir Mello Frankel set theory with choice, uh, if you were wondering. Okay, so since then forcing um, has been used to just prove that every uh, classical set theoretic problem was, uh, can't be solved. Not every, but uh, almost all of them. The, the, most of the basic properties of uncountable sets cannot be determined in, in ZFC. I mean, and I'm saying most and almost every, but uh, obviously those are not precise terms. It, but it just seems like um, if you pick a random interesting property of uncountable sets, uh, either it's usually either it's trivial to establish it or it's impossible to, you know, uh, prove or refute it. Okay, so uh, the philosophical question that this raises is um, whether these results show that, that CH has no answer whatsoever. Um, uh, Cohen took that um, stance, basically, that uh, forcing gives you the definitive answer to CH, and the answer is that uh, there is no answer. But uh, it also seems reasonable to, to think that what these results are showing is just that uh, ZFC is a weak theory. And uh, so it just, it doesn't determine these properties, but there's no reason to believe uh, that there are no axioms that, uh, true axioms that determine uh, whether CH is true, for example. So V is equal to L is, um, is a natural candidate for an axiom because it, it says that um, it rules out pathological models of set theory. Basically, so all, all the models of V is equal to L are sort of canonical, um, and the models that are built by forcing are sort of weird and pathological. So maybe you would like to rule them out by assuming something like V is equal to L. Anyway, so uh, this program for binding new axioms has actually revealed a, a lot of axioms. Uh, arguably true axioms beyond ZFC. So the, there's sort of the, the generalizations of ZFC. So you can think of ZFC as a, a generalization of um, piano arithmetic and second order arithmetic. It's just the, 
the higher order version of that, and large cardinal hypotheses can be thought of as higher order versions of ZFC, and these form a hierarchy. Um, the, the way the large heart cardinal hypotheses work is that they add um, stronger and stronger axioms of infinity uh, to ZFC. So they, they tell you about the existence of large transfinite cardinals, uh, so large that, the, that you can't prove that they exist in ZFC. So the, the most basic example is inaccessible cardinals. So a cardinal is inaccessible if you can't um, reach it by any of the basic set theoretic operations that are given to you by ZFC. So basically by unions and power sets. Um, so, so more formally, it's inaccessible if whenever you have a, a family of sets of size less than the cardinal kappa that's indexed by subsets of a set of size less than the cardinal, then the union of all of them has size less than the cardinal. So that, that's all I mean by unreachable. If you take a bunch of small sets, uh, well, I guess if you take a small bunch of small sets, then it's union. Don't forget by regularity. Oh, well, I indexed by uh, subsets of I, not by I. So, uh, so that tells you it's also a strong limit. If, if you index by elements of I, this would just be regularity. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. I, was, I was just cheating because I thought, you know, uh, everyone here would be a computer scientist. So uh, they, I wanted to have only one clause in the definition. Okay, sorry. Um, so, um, Aleph zero is inaccessible. That's the, I mean, I, I want to say it's the first example of an inaccessible cardinal, but actually, if you look at this definition, uh, zero and one are also inaccessible cardinals, uh, except that I wrote transfinite. Um, the next inaccessible cardinal is pretty big. I mean, Aleph zero is also pretty big if you're a finite cardinal. So compared to Aleph zero, the, the first uncountable inaccessible is also very big. Um, so. For example, if Alex C is an inaccessible cardinal for some C bigger than zero, then uh, the Xth level of the cumulative hierarchy satisfies the axioms of set theory. Um, so that, and that makes sense because the, the whole point of an inaccessible cardinal is that it's closed under the basic set theoretic operations that, uh, that give you uh, ZF. Uh, so it makes sense that if you look at close under the power set that many times, you will be closed under the basic set theoretic operations, enough operations to satisfy ZF. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, ZFC doesn't prove that there's an uncountable and accessible cardinal. So the one way to see that is to just cite the girdle incompleteness theorem. But another way to see it is, well, just like let Aleph C be the, the least inaccessible cardinal, then look at V sub C, uh, well, V sub C is a model of ZFC, but it uh, it can't have any inaccessible cardinals in it because, well, because Aleph C was the least inaccessible cardinal, uh, uncountable inaccessible cardinal. And similarly, having one uncountable inaccessible doesn't imply two. Um, and, and by the way, uh, you can think of Aleph zero as the, the least inaccessible cardinal. Uh, so the existence of an inaccessible cardinal is sort of the same as the, the usual axiom of infinity. And uh, so the, the, this fact that one uncountable inaccessible doesn't imply there are two is, is um, similar to the fact that if you take the axiom of infinity out of ZFC, then you can't prove it. Um, so, so it's sort of like ZFC plus an uncountable inaccessible is uh, generalizing ZFC in the same way that uh, ZFC generalizes ZFC minus the axiom of infinity. Um, so uh, ZFC minus the axiom of infinity is uh, by interpretable, I think, uh, with uh, piano arithmetic. So adding more inaccessibles is like uh, repeating this, this generalization from finite to transfinite or more. So it's a natural thing to do. 
as a set theorist, if you're interested in transfinite cardinals, um, to, to study these inaccessible cardinals and, and generalizations. Okay, so uh, kind of example of how large cardinals come up, why you should be interested in them, uh, is so um, large cardinals kind of come up when when you're trying to prove the consistency of theories. So for example, um, inaccessible cardinals come up uh, in the theory of um, Lebesgue measurability even. So just for, for pretty small sets, uh, inaccessible cardinals are relevant. So uh, uh, people, uh, most people are convinced that uh, you can't construct uh, without the axiom of choice or in a definable way, a set that has no Lebesgue measure, uh, a Lebesgue non-measurable set. Uh, but the truth is that that, that idea is, um, well, the fact that that's true requires uh, the consistency of inaccessible cardinals. So uh, Solovey and Shalat separately uh, showed this fact that ZFC plus an inaccessible cardinal, meaning uncountable inaccessible cardinal, is equally consistent with ZFC plus every um, definable set of real numbers uh, being the big measurable. And by definable, I just mean first order definable in the structure uh, of R with access to the integers and uh, plus and times, uh, which is called projective. Um, there's another uh, more, I don't know, analysis-like uh, definition of projective set up here, but, uh, but what it really is is the, the definable subsets of R. Uh, and, and more precisely, what happens is if you have a countable model of ZFC with an inaccessible cardinal, then you can use forcing uh, to make all the definable uh, sets Lebesgue measurable. Um, and, and you can even build a model that satisfies ZFC, but not the axiom of choice in which all sets are Lebesgue measurable. Um, anyway, I didn't want to talk about that too much. And um, if you have a model of ZFC in which every sigma 1, 3 set, or let's just say all the definable sets are Lebesgue measurable, then uh, the Aleph 1 of that model, so Aleph 1 M means Aleph 1 according to the models. So model of set theory is a model of the foundational axioms of math. Uh, every mathematical object has an interpretation inside of that model, so that's what Aleph 1 to the M means. Uh, so Aleph 1 of M is inaccessible in L beta, so the minimum model of the same height as M. So that, that's kind of how these things always work. Uh, if you want to prove a theory is consistent, you take a model with a large cardinal in it, and you transform the large cardinal by forcing uh, into a, a statement that you're trying to prove is consistent. And then if you want to gauge the strength of a statement, you can take a model of your statement and extract from it a canonical model, like L, uh, in which the large cardinal axiom is true. So large cardinals become kind of um, the universal method for gauging the consistency um, and the strength of, um, of set theories. Okay, so here's a picture. Um, I, I stole this from Dan Satrick Nielsen's website. Uh, so thank you, Dan. Um, so the, the, there are lots of large cardinal axioms uh, beyond inaccessibles. Inaccessibles are just the very bottom of the hierarchy. And I mean, th this isn't all the large cardinal axioms. You can, you can zoom in anywhere in this picture and, and there are many more large cardinal axioms. It's a very intricate structure. Um, and uh, I don't know. Well, there's this little line here that says V is equal to L. Uh, so I guess I should talk about that. Um, so a measurable cardinal is a cardinal um, such that any set that cardinality uh, carries a, a total uh, zero one valued probability measure, uh, otherwise known as a Kappa complete ultra filter. Um, so anyway, um, Aleph zero is measurable because there are ultra filters on Omega or on the natural numbers. 
Uh, but uncountable measurable cardinals have to be really big. Um, let's see, let's see FC. Scott showed that if there's a measurable cardinal, then V is not equal to L. Uh, and um, Silver, maybe Robottom showed that actually not only is V not L, every infinite cardinal, uh, every truly transfinite cardinal appears to be inaccessible in L, meaning if L takes uh, a bunch of small sets indexed by the L power set of a small set, uh, its union is smaller than that infinite cardinal. Solovey showed, um, just assuming a measurable cardinal, that these uh, sigma 1, 2 sets are Lebesgue measurable. So sigma 1, 2 is a, a weaker version of projective. So you can't show this in, in ZFC alone. So uh, the measurable cardinals, uh, so inaccessible cardinals allow you to show the consistency of um, projective sets being Lebesgue measurable. Um, so this sort of... Um, intuitively obvious facts about analysis and measurable cardinals outright prove these facts. And actually I should point out that uh, you don't need an inaccessible cardinal to prove the consistency of every sigma one two set being Lebesgue measurable. You need it for sigma one three, which is what I said before, but okay, not a big deal. Uh, this fact can't be proved in ZFC. It's an important thing. Okay, on the other hand, measurable cardinals can't settle the continuum hypothesis. So these sort of low down facts about, um, about definable sets of real numbers can be settled by large cardinal axioms and basically all of them are, if you go up to strong enough large cardinal axioms, far beyond a measurable cardinal. Uh, but, uh, but the continuum hypothesis is actually um, immune to the charms of large cardinals. Uh, it, it can't be settled by any large cardinal axiom. So I wanna talk about uh, different axioms that are not large cardinal axioms. Uh, so the one axiom that I think has, has been uh, justified in the past uh, 20 years. So the, this is called the ground axiom. So if, if you have two models of set theory, uh, one is a ground of the other, if the other is a generic extension of the one. So if that M so we say that M is a ground of N if N is a generic extension of M. So the, the intuition that forcing shows CH has no answer um, sort of rests on the fact that, um, that the generic extensions that you built are, are just as good as the models you started with. Um, sort of you can't distinguish between the theory of a generic extension and the theory of its grounds. Um, and therefore, it's not just that CFC uh, doesn't decide CH, but uh, there, there's no right answer because we have these models and they're all equally good. Um, so the problem though is that if you build a model using forcing, then it satisfies the sentence the universe of sets has a non-trivial ground, meaning the universe of sets can be obtained from some smaller model uh, by adding in one set, sort of uh, not um, intuitively for me, that seems uh, not very believable, but okay, maybe Maybe the universe of sets can be obtained from many different models by adding in one set. You can't distinguish the universe of sets from all those ground models either. And I don't know, there's some kind of indiscernibility. Maybe that's, maybe that's just how it is. Um, okay, but the, the ground axiom, which is just a set theoretic principle, put axiom in the name of something to make it sound like it's true, but that doesn't make it true. Uh, the ground axiom, says that the universe of sets has no non-trivial ground. So it's the negation of, of what is true in every forcing extension. So you can't build a model of the ground axiom by a uh, generic extension. And every time you take a model and take a generic extension, you're, you're never gonna get a model of the ground axiom. Okay, the mantle is the intersection of all the grounds of a model of set theory. So if you take a, a model of set theory n, you get the mantle by intersecting every ground. So it's this, I don't know, 
you might hope that uh, that you get the minimum ground of a model that way. Um, but it's not clear. It could be that you take the intersection of all the grounds and you don't get a ground back. Um, anyway, the mantle of, of V is denoted by uh, math BBM, uh, blackboard, old M. Uh, and Usuba proved that the mantle is a model of ZFC. Uh, that's sort of, um, it's not obvious from the definition that the mantle even satisfies ZF. Um, the, the problem is that it's not clear that if you go to a ground of V uh, and you build the mantle in that ground, that you'll actually get the mantle of V. That's what you need to prove that the mantle satisfies ZF. And then choice is a, another matter. Uh, the, the way you prove choice in the mantle is you sort of show that uh, the levels of the mantle are actually levels of the grounds of V. So uh, at some point, uh, the V alpha of the mantle stabilizes and becomes uh, the V alpha of just some uh, ground, small enough ground. So that all these things come uh, well from a pretty amazing theorem, Usuba proved. Still not the Usuba's theorem of the title of the talk, um, but uh, the, the theorem says that if you intersect any set of grounds, in particular if you intersect two grounds, um, then contained in that intersection is another ground. So it's um, this is just from like 2017. Uh, and it's kind of fundamental property of the structure of forcing that wasn't known for, I don't know, for 60 or 50 years. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, I meant to say here that you can reformulate yeah. my own axiom. Yeah. But those results, you don't need large cardinals. Uh, yeah, this is all in ZFC. Uh, is that what you asked? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's all proved in CFC. Um, so let's see. You can reformulate the ground axiom as the statement that V is equal to the mantle, right? Because uh, if the ground axiom is true and there are no non-trivial grounds, then certainly V is going to be equal to the intersection of all the grounds of V. V is a ground of itself. It's a trivial ground. Um, and, and conversely, if V is the mantle and the ground axiom has to hold. Um, so you can vary the, the question of the ground axiom by just asking how, um, how large is the mantle, how close is the mantle to V, and uh, there's a principle uh, due basically to Wooden and Hamkins that says that the mantle is very far from V. Um, the principle is a kind of forcing axiom uh, a weird kind of forcing axiom. It says, um, it's trying to say that sort of the universe of sets is, is very far out into the, you know, process of doing generic extensions. I don't know, that's a vague way to say it, but um, so let's see. So if you have a countable model of set theory and an element of the model, uh, property P of sets, meaning a first order property, say that P is necessary, of uh, the set X if uh, if X has the property P in every generic extension of M. And P is forcibly necessary if there's a generic extension of M in which P is necessary of X. So, so that means you can generically extend M uh, so that after that point, uh, this property uh, P holds of X in every further extension. So one such property is the property of being countable. Um, the, the point is, if you're in a countable model of set theory and you have some element, then you can actually find a, a generic set that um, witnesses that the element is truly countable, since every element of a countable model is countable. And once you've made the, the set countable, you can't make it not countable anymore. So it's forced to be necessary. Um, so you can't, you can't extend a model and make a countable set uncountable. It's, it's not possible. 
So the strong maximality principle says that countability is basically the only forcibly necessary property. Um, so in, in other words, um, a model, a countable model satisfies the strong maximality principle if uh, whenever you take an element of the model uh, and you go to a generic extension in which uh, the element becomes countable, then the element actually immediately satisfies all the forcibly necessary properties of that element. So it's saying, um, for example, uh, if you have a forcibly necessary property of the empty set, meaning a, a sentence that can be forced to be necessary, uh, then uh, it's true. And then the, the thing with parameters, the, the problem is just, you, you can't say that all the forcibly necessary properties of every set true because uh, not every set is countable. So this is saying that they become true as soon as possible. So as soon as you make the set countable, you realize every single one of its forcibly necessary properties. So, um, so the strong maximality principle seems to be saying like uh, the universe has already, you know, it's been obtained by doing lots and lots of forcing. And um, Hampton showed that uh, a model of the strong ma maximality principle actually uh, is extremely far away from its own mantle. So it, it's sort of like the situation between L and the, the constructible universe and, and the universe uh, when there's a measurable. So in this case, um, Aleph, uh, every successor cardinal, um, Aleph alpha plus one becomes inaccessible in the mantle. Okay, so the mantle is sort of tiny under this principle. Um, I, I think that the strong maximality principle doesn't actually um, appear anywhere in the literature. I think I just made up the name. The, there's something called the boldface maximality principle, which is a little bit stronger than the strong maximality principle, if, um, if you're interested in these things. Okay, uh, so Usuba's theorem, finally, the thing from the title, uh, gotten through the the background enough. Uh, well, it, it has a large cardinal hypothesis, a very strong large cardinal hypothesis. So let me say what that is first. So the strongest large cardinal hypotheses, they, they, they don't um, a priori really even look like large cardinal hypotheses, but they are. Uh, they, they're expressed in terms of elementary embeddings of levels of, of V, or even of V itself, we'll see later. So um, extendable cardinals are, are defined as follows. So kappa is extendable if whenever you have an ordinal gamma, uh, you can find an elementary embedding from the level V gamma of the cumulative hierarchy into a possibly larger level V gamma prime, uh, which sort of um, it doesn't really change sets of size less than kappa, but it does blow up every set of size greater than or equal to kappa. That's um, so that, that's this fact here, I of x uh, has the same cardinality as x if and only if x is smaller than kappa, or the cardinality of x is smaller than kappa. And this condition uh, is just saying, well, that the critical point of i, which is denoted by crit i, is kappa. So this is, that's the definition of the critical point. So, um, Usuba proved if there's an extendable cardinal, then the mantle is a ground of V. So it actually is this minimum ground of V. Um, and uh, that has um, well, pretty strong consequences. Uh, grounds of V, if you can obtain V from a model just by adding a single set, then that model has to be very big. Um, so for example, it has to be correct about uh, the transfinite cardinals for sufficiently large cardinals. Um, and so in particular, uh, it's not true that all the Aleph alpha plus ones of V appear to be inaccessible in the mantle. They actually just appear to be Aleph alpha plus ones because the mantle knows everything there is to know about sufficiently large uh, sufficiently large cardinals. Um, but I, another important thing here is uh, when, you, when you do forcing, 
it seems like you're starting with this model and you're you're going outwards and building forcing extensions and then the idea behind this sort of the grounds ideas the ground axiom ideas was well also you can go inwards and look at the grounds but this shows that actually the original picture where you're, you're just forcing outwards is kind of uh, at least under large cardinal axioms, exactly what's going on. There's this smallest model, the mantle, and everything else is just built uh, above it by forcing. Um, and it, it's sort of suggestive, like if uh, the universe V is actually just obtained from this canonical smallest ground by forcing, uh, and it's very close to just being this ground, like the, the mantle has all this information, about the universe of sets and it also sees all these other forcing extensions why why are you in this universe of sets uh, and not one of the other forcing extensions and if you're going to be in any of them why why isn't the universe of sets just the mantle why isn't it the canonical one the only definable uh element of this structure that contains all the forcing extensions of the mantle is the mantle itself. So it's the only canonical model uh, there is among all these forcing extensions and grounds. So it seems sort of strange to, to be in any theory except the one that says that V is the mantle. But anyway, uh, for example, the theory that says the mantle is tiny uh, is false. So the strong maximality principle is false assuming an extendable cardinal. I haven't done anything to try to justify these extremely strong large cardinals, but that would take even longer than I've already taken. Background. Okay, so uh, the, the point of this talk was to talk about the, the hypothesis that there's an extendable cardinal in, in Usuba's theorem. Um, and the, the, the hypothesis is very, very strong. Um, it's one of the strongest uh, large cardinal hypotheses hypotheses that's ever been studied. I mean, there are much stronger things, but this one is, is very strong. Uh, and uh, Usuba asked if you could reduce it, and the answer is no. And that's a theorem I, I proved recently. That I think a bunch of people worked on this problem, so that's, that's why I'm talking about it. Um, so more, more precisely, it's, um, it's consistent that there's an extendable cardinal, uh, Aleph Xi, uh, such that Usuba's theorem is false in V6C. Um, so that means Usuba's theorem is false. When I say that, I just mean that the mantle is not a ground. So you have this model of set theory with an extendable cardinal. Uh, and if you look at the universe below the extendable cardinal, this V6C, uh, then Usuba's theorem is false there. But uh, the, the main pattern in the large cardinal hierarchy is that if you have a large cardinal, Aleph Xi, and you look at V sub Xi, then every weaker large cardinal hypothesis is true in V sub Xi. Uh, and so uh, it follows that since you can find a model with an extendable cardinal, so that Usuba's theorem is false below the extendable cardinal, uh, no large cardinal hypothesis that's weaker than an extendable cardinal can imply Usuba's theorem. Right, because we've got this model of set theory, V sub C, it satisfies every large cardinal hypothesis weaker than Usuba's theorem, and it also satisfies the negation of Usuba's theorem. Sorry, it satisfies every large cardinal hypothesis weaker than an extendable cardinal, but also the negation of Usuba's theorem. Okay, so, so extendable is exactly the right hypothesis for Usuba's theorem. So I just, I want to say a little bit about how the proof of this uh, consistency result or optimality result goes. Um, so th th there are two constraints on the solution, really. Um, and they have to do with this notion of an A extendable cardinal. So a kappa, uh, cardinal kappa is A extendable if for any gamma, um, there is an elementary embedding from V gamma to V gamma plus one with critical point kappa. And uh, the, the embedding shifts the class A to itself. Okay, so uh, I mean, if A is a trivial class, like a very simple class, like V itself, this is not um, any different from being extendable. 
But if you take a more complicated class, for example, the mantle itself, then this becomes uh, a different notion. And um, the, the issue, um, one of the constraints that I'm going to talk about is that if you have an extendable cardinal Alex C, then uh, if Alex C is also M extendable, where M is the mantle, then Usuba's theorem does hold in V sub C. Which means that uh, this kind of counterexample or um, this witness to the optimality of Usuba's theorem, where you have an extendable cardinal, uh, but uh, Usuba's theorem fails below the extendable cardinal, uh, it can't be achieved if that extendable cardinal is actually extendable with respect to the mantle or M extendable. Uh, so the, the, the issue, the problem that poses is that um, all the techniques known for, um, for, for proving consistency results um, with extendable cardinals, you have to preserve extendability. So you start with a model with an extendable cardinal and you do some kind of forcing and you need to preserve the extendable cardinal. And whenever you do that, uh, you actually, so if you start with a model M, uh, in the extension, you're going to have an M extendable cardinal. So if you started with a model of the ground axiom, so if you're given this arbitrary model, the ground axiom, and you just try to force uh, over it and use the usual ex uh, preservation uh, techniques for extendability, you're always going to get an M extendable in, in the extension. And... Uh, so you're not going to have a counterexample to the Subas theorem. So you need to preserve extendability in a different way. Uh, and then the, the second constraint um, was, well, okay, so there's this thing called the local ground axiom. Uh, and if the mantle satisfies the local ground axiom, which just says the ground axiom is true uh, in every inaccessible level of the cumulative hierarchy, so in V gamma whenever Aleph gamma is an inaccessible cardinal. Um, so if the mantle satisfies that, then every extendable cardinal is M extendable. Um, and so this gives you a second constraint, which is that, um, so if the mantle satisfies LGA, then, um, then, so if you're in a model whose mantle satisfies LGA, then that model can't be a, a, a witness to the optimality of Usubis theorem because you have that every extendable cardinal is M extendable, so you have that Usuba's theorem holds in V C, where Aleph C is the extendable cardinal by the first lemma. So you can never get a counterexample uh, or a proof of the optimality of Usuba's theorem starting with a model uh, that, whose mantle satisfies LGA. And so the constraint is that if you start with a model whose mantle satisfies LGA, and then you try to take a forcing extension or a generic extension of it that witnesses the op optimality of Usuba's theorem, you're stuck. You can't because the mantle of that generic extension still satisfies LGA because the mantle is not changed when you force. That's the whole kind of the whole point of the mantle. The mantle is uh, constructed so that it doesn't change when you do forcing because it's just the intersection of all the grounds. So you can't kill this assumption the mantle satisfies LGA by uh, set forcing, so by generic extensions. So, so somehow you have to not do a generic extension and you need a new technique for preserving extendability. Okay, so, so how do you um, achieve this? Um, so it, it seems like I will not talk about the HUD conjecture, but that's fine. I'll just talk about Usuba's theorem. I have two minutes left. So what's the, um, the way to, to circumvent the problem that uh, every generic extension might fail to be a counter, uh, a proof of the optimality of Usuba's theorem? So what you do is you, you actually start with a model that satisfies some kind of weird forcing axiom, sort of like the one that Hampkins uh, and Wooden introduced. So this actually, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is something that uh, it's an open question of wooden. Um, so a statement is, is possible if um, for any ordinal alpha, uh, you can find 
a generic extension that preserves V alpha. So it doesn't add any new elements uh, of uh, the alpha level of the cumulative hierarchy, but so that the beta element, I mean, the, the beta level of the cumulative hierarchy of the extension now satisfies this formula V of X. Okay, so, so by arbitrarily, um, you can preserve an arbitrary level of the cumulative hierarchy while making phi of x true in some higher level of the cumulative hierarchy. That's what possible means. And the potentialist hypothesis that Wooden introduced was that for every set x and every possible formula phi of x, uh, there's some ordinal beta such that phi beta satisfies phi of x. So if you could force this thing to be true in a level of the cumulative hierarchy uh, by arbitrarily, uh, by a forcing that preserves an arbitrary level of the cumulative hierarchy, then it actually already is true in some level of the cumulative hierarchy. Okay, that uh, it's an open question whether this potentialist hypothesis is even consistent. Uh, and the reason is that it's, I mean, there's a natural way you would try to, to prove it's consistent, which is, okay, you have a, you have a, possible formula and you force it. Um, now uh, you've made it true in some V beta and now you look at the next possible formula. You want to force that and you can force it and preserve V beta. So you, you don't destroy that you force the first potentialist hypothesis and you want to iterate that. And the problem is that uh, the techniques for iterating forcing don't uh, mesh well with this just preservation of a single level of the the cumulative hierarchy. You need stronger um, structural properties of the generic extension. So the one that is um, most useful here is directed closed forcing. So that, that's a generalization of preserving V alpha. It's, it's much stronger. It, it means you preserve all V alpha sequences, for example. Anyway, uh, so a statement is very possible if it's possible uh, and you can use a generic extension that's um, arbitrarily directed closed. And the weak potentialist hypothesis is just the potentialist hypothesis, but restricting to very possible formulas instead of possible ones. And the point is um, you can force this WPH thing. So, uh, but not by a traditional generic extension by, by an iterated uh, forcing construction. So it's exactly the argument I was starting to give. So you want to iterate these forcings and force every very possible sentence. But the thing is, the theory of iterated forcing works well with directed closed forcing, which I'm not even defining. Uh, and so you actually can make the weak potentialist hypothesis true. Um, and then the idea is, uh, to get this um, proof of the optimality of Usuba's theorem, uh, since this constraint said we couldn't just start with an arbitrary model because it might have no generic extension that witnesses the optimality of Usuba's theorem, we're actually gonna, well, we're given this arbitrary model and we wanna, with an extendable cardinal, and we wanna get a model with an extendable cardinal so that Usuba's theorem fails below the extendable cardinal. And what you do is you first do this iterated forcing and make the weak potentialist hypothesis true. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, you, you do a class forcing to make to the weak potential. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah so when yeah. I say generic extension, I mean a set generic extension. And so the difference here is that all you do is a, a class forcing extension, which is uh, to, to be precise, the Easton iteration of these forcings that force every very possible sentence. And that just works and it makes uh, WPH true. And also and, another comment. Uh, actually, my understanding is that you have more than one hour. So you can, you can... Oh, I, I do? Okay. Because I, I told Vincenzo that I would only take one hour. But now it, it seems that I will take somewhat more than one hour because I spent so much time telling you guys what ordinals are. Um, so, um, yeah. So, so is it true that I have more than one hour? Maybe you can make a short post so that people who are not interested can leave and then the one that's one. Okay. 
that's that's the final point as well. We can take a, a short break right now if you want. Well, maybe you want to say something more, you know. Okay, I, I mean, I can, I can, um, I can finish with the Usubis theorem part, and then there's a little bit left at the end that I can talk about after a break. Um, okay, so, so yeah, you can uh, always extend by a class forcing uh, any model of CFC to get the WPH to be true. Um, okay, so the, the this is just the thing I was saying about how do you force WPH? It's just this iterated forcing construction, not the obvious thing to do. Uh, so now, what? Why? Why do that? Well, there, there's this classical forcing that um, makes the the ground axiom false, which is another class forcing, but it's not an iteration of forcings. It's what's called a product of forcings. The iterated forcing uh, here actually makes the ground axiom true. Um, in fact, WPH implies that the ground axiom is true. Um, but OK, so we'll first force WPH, and then we're going to do this weird product forcing over that model. So it's it's called an Easton forcing. Uh, so it's the, exactly the forcing that Easton used in his famous generalization of Cohen's independence theorem that shows that the behavior of the continuum function, so the function that takes a cardinal kappa to two to the kappa, uh, is arbitrary for regular cardinals kappa. Um, so anyway, uh, WPH um, implies that you can do an east enforcing over VXC, where aleph xi is the first extendable cardinal, and preserve extendability. So that's the that's the whole point here. If if you first prepare your model so that it's a model of WPH, then you can force over the model with an east enforcing, preserve the extendable cardinal, but use the fact that Easton's construction gives an example of a model whose mantle is not a ground. So since you're doing this forcing over VXC uh, that makes the mantle not a ground, you get that in the final model. Uh, VXC uh, does not satisfy the ground axiom. I mean, does not uh, the mantle of VXC is not a ground right? because uh, because that's what Easton's construction gives you, uh, and then you use the WPH uh, to give a new, a different preservation argument for the extendable cardinal that that says that the extendable cardinal is preserved by these Easton product forcings. As long as well, the product is, I don't know, sparse enough. Okay, so let's see. Um, I, so let me finish up for the people who aren't interested, um, and then we can take a break. Uh, so the 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 thing I wanted to say about this is, well, this is I think the first example of a theorem that uh, really needs. An extendable cardinal, so that's that's part of the interest of this. Um, and, and then the, there are some important um, conjectures in set theory that involve extendable cardinals that I'll talk about after the break. Um, that are closely related uh, to Usuba's theorem. So you know, it's um, it's sort of interesting. Um, the exact large cardinal hypothesis that you need here. I mean, it raises lots of questions, like, for example, that uh, strong maximality principle, um, which said that every forcibly necessary property of a set holds as soon as the set is countable. Um, you could ask whether that holds, uh, that can hold in V sub C, if aleph C is an extendable cardinal. And that just looks like a, I mean, well, either it's just false or it's a completely impossible problem. I mean, it, it's not even known whether that principle is consistent with a strong cardinal. So anyway, it's um, there are a lot of interesting things you could do here. Okay, so uh, let's take a break. Okay, so let's do a five minute. 
Okay. Uh, thanks. So I want to talk about um, Hod now and the Hod conjecture and its relationship with extendable cardinals and its sort of relationship with Usubis uh, theorem. So uh, said before, Scott's theorem is that L doesn't contain a measurable cardinal, um, but there are generalizations of L that contain measurable cardinals. Um, so when I say a generalization of L, I mean an L-like model. Uh, in other words, this model that satisfies the generalized continuum hypothesis, the axiom of choice, and sort of most, most importantly, it's a model whose construction is um, sort of so canonical that you can answer every question you might ask about it. So that, that was one of the things I said about L in a boldface empirical fact on, on slide three or so. It's a major question, though, whether there are models like this for every large cardinal axiom. And for example, it's open whether there's a canonical model with an extendable cardinal in it. Um, so uh, uh, HOD, the model I'm going to talk about here, is um, it's not a canonical model, but it can have extendable cardinals and, and much more. Um, so if you have a, a structure M, instead of iterating the definability operator, as in the definition of L, you can iterate the second order definability operator. So that just means that uh, you allow definitions that refer to subsets of M. So it's the second order definability over M is just, um, well, the second order definable subsets of M are just the subsets of M that are first order definable or just definable in the language of set theory over the structure as the power set of M and M. And HOD is the version of L that you get if you iterate this. Okay, so you start with nothing and you just iterate second order definability through all the ordinals. So it, it looks a bit like L, but it's completely different from L. Um, the reason is that it's second order definability is um, it's not really a canonical operation. It's very much uh, um, fragile under forcing or under generic extensions. So you can you can change HOD um, you can a lot just by forcing, and in fact you can you can make HOD satisfy whatever you want. HOD doesn't have to satisfy the generalized continuum hypothesis. Space. Basically, the one thing that HOD does have to satisfy is the axiom of choice. Um, like then that's sort of a theorem. The only things that you can prove about HOD in ZF are the things that you can prove in ZFC. That's literally a theorem. So anything that's consistent with ZFC can be true in HOD. OK, so the HOD dichotomy is um, a generalization of something that's true about L. This is Jensen's covering lemma, So, or covering dichotomy, I guess, as it's stated here. Um, exactly one of the following two things holds. Either L is a very large model, uh, very close to being all of V, um, in the sense that every uncountable subset of L is, is covered or included in a constructible set with the same cardinality, or L is a very small model. Uh, every infinite cardinal is inaccessible in L, which you might remember was a, a consequence of a measurable cardinal. Um, so the, the first disjunct here, the, the reason it, well, it, it says that you can approximate sets pretty well by constructible sets. Um, the thing is, if you have a model of set theory with the property that every subset of the model is actually an element of the model, then that model has to be V. So this is saying something slightly weaker, I mean, slightly, something weaker, uh, but it's uh, it's saying L is close to being all of V. There are good approximations to every uh, subset of L that are actually themselves constructible in L. In L. Uh, and Wooden uh, much later generalized this theorem to Hod. Um, so the, the theorem he proved, which is called the Hod dichotomy theorem, is uh, if you have an extendable cardinal Alex C, then exactly one of the following holds. Either every subset of Hod of size at least Alex C is covered by a set 
in Hod of the same size, same cardinality. Uh, or, uh, well, for all regular cardinals greater than or equal to the extendable cardinal, the cardinal is measurable in Hod. So measurable is stronger than inaccessible. Um, you, you can't actually have that every cardinal above the inaccessible, I mean, above the extendable is inaccessible in, in Hod. Um, for example, Aleph, uh, alpha plus omega for, for any alpha is never going to be inaccessible in Hod because Hod, uh, you can, it's second order definable. Uh, the, the sequence Aleph, alpha, Aleph, alpha plus one, Aleph, alpha plus two is going to be put into Hod because it's second order definable over basically the structure Aleph, alpha plus omega with membership. So, uh, yeah. Did someone ask them this? Yeah. No? Okay. I, I can't hear if there's a question. I, I wish I could. Um, so yeah, I, I said here, uh, every successor cardinal will be measurable in HOD, for example, but also, I mean, successor cardinal above the first extendable. So th there's a, you know, this it's, strikingly similar to Jensen's theorem, but for a model that is completely different from L. So the, the surprising thing about Wooden's theorem, uh, I guess, is that um, generalizations of Jensen's theorem were, were known for L-like models, um, but there was nothing like this known for a model like Hod that's not canonical. And uh, it seems like Jensen's theorem uh, uses very heavily the fact that um, that L is canonical. It uses the structure of L in, in pretty deep ways. Um, so it's the, the proof of Wooden's theorem is just completely different from Jensen's proof and uh, relies on this large cardinal hypothesis. So anyway, the Hod conjecture though, well, we know that if you assume large cardinal axioms, then uh, in Jensen's dichotomy, you have to be on the side where L is a small model. So every infinite cardinal is inaccessible in L. But um, no large cardinal hypothesis can imply that you're on the small side of the Hod dichotomy. Um, actually, no large cardinal hypothesis can, uh, can imply that V is not equal to Hod. Um, so the, the reason is whenever you have a model with a large cardinal in it, you can force to build an extension class forcing that still has the large cardinal, but now satisfies V is equal to hot. You just you have to make everything second order definable, which you can do by encoding things into the behavior of the continuum function. So it's actually, it's more, more of Easton's theorem uh, that does this for you. Okay, but but Wooden conjectured that you can decide which disjunct of the the Hod dichotomy you're in uh, using large cardinals uh, because the conjecture, which is called the Hod conjecture, is that um, if you have an extendable cardinal, then in fact Hod has to be very close to V. So the, the covering for Hod should be true, assuming large cardinal axioms. Um, and uh, in, it's a sort of strange conjecture because it's saying that um, somehow arbitrary sets are very close to being uh, definable sets, um, which uh, goes against a lot of uh, intuition in, in set theory that if something is not obviously definable, then it's probably not definable. So that there are lots of pathological objects that you construct using the axiom of choice, and there seems to be no reason why uh, large cardinal axioms would imply that those objects can be defined. But there, there is some evidence that uh, Wooden's Hogg conjecture will be true if and only if there are L-like models for all large cardinal axioms. Um, so, so that makes it an important test question for one of the, the biggest uh, the most important problems in set theory, the question of building L-like models for large cardinals. 
which itself is important because of the, uh, the relationship between the large cardinals and the, the strength of theories. If you want to gauge the strength of a theory, you need to be able to build um, an L-like model for large cardinals at the level of that theory. So for example, if you want to figure out what is the consistency strength of a strong axiom like PFA or strongly compact cardinals, you would need to be able to, to build inner models at the level of super compact cardinals. So I don't know, many open questions rest on, on whether there are L-like models for uh, very large cardinals. So that, that's sort of the the motivation for looking at the Hodge conjecture, as well as the sort of philosophical question of whether you have um, whether V is close to second order definability. So um, recently, I've been looking at sort of connections between the Hodge dichotomy and, and structural properties of uh, large cardinal embeddings. So I said before, lots of large cardinal axioms are formulated in terms of embeddings from levels of the cumulative hierarchy into certain models. Um, and uh, it turns out that the Hod dichotomy is equivalent to um, uniqueness or canonicity properties of these embeddings. So I need this definition. So two embeddings are, are delta similar for some ordinal delta. If um, not only do they map delta to the same place, if you look at where they map ordinals less than delta, so that they map them to some other ordinals, but uh, if you take the supremum of those two things uh, for each of the embeddings, uh, those supremums are the same. So the, the embeddings may be discontinuous at delta, which just means that the supremum of uh, J0 of C for C less than delta is strictly less than delta. And if they are discontinuous, then it is saying something stronger than just that J0 of delta is equal to J1 of delta. It's that the, the smaller supremum is equal for both embeddings. So if, uh, if kappa is an extendable cardinal, then the following are equivalent. So one, the Hod conjecture, meaning uh, that Hod has this covering property uh, with respect to V. And two, if um, so for arbitrarily large ordinals delta, for all sufficiently large alpha, if you have two embeddings from V alpha into some model M that are delta similar, then they actually agree on all ordinals less than delta. So um, actually, I say arbitrarily large ordinals here, it, it will actually be true for every regular cardinal above the extendable. The hot conjecture is true. And then conversely, if you know this is true for arbitrarily large ordinals delta, then you can just prove the hot conjecture. Um, an extendable cardinal isn't actually really the right hypothesis here, which you can kind of see because um, if you look at the second disjunct, there's, there's no reference to the cardinal kappa. Well, actually, there's no reference to the cardinal kappa anywhere. In this, uh, <laughs> sort of embedded in the definition of the Hod conjecture, there is a reference to an extendable cardinal kappa, but there's nothing there in the second disjunct which is a little strange. Okay. Um, but the, the reason this is sort of um, an interesting connection is one, well, it seems like this is a sort of basic combinatorial property of elementary embeddings now, instead of uh, this question about second order definability, which is sort of this, I don't know, mysterious uh, thing, you, you now have a, a question just about structural properties of elementary embeddings, and uh, that seems like it's more approachable combinatorially. Um, and uh, there are actually certain versions of this uniqueness property that are just provable. So that's what we'll talk about for a second. So a lot of important large cardinal axioms aren't just expressed in terms of embeddings of the cumulative hierarchy, they're expressed in terms of embeddings of all of V itself. So for example, um, cardinals measurable, if and only if there's an elementary embedding from V to M, the critical point kappa. Um, also, you could say that kappa is measurable if there's an elementary embedding of some level of the cumulative hierarchy to some model M. Critical point kappa. But 
do this one. Uh, so uh, Wooden asked whether uh, two elementary embeddings from the universe of sets into the same model of set theory have to agree on the ordinals. So this is a version of the uniqueness um, property from the previous page, um, where delta, instead of the embeddings being delta similar for some ordinal delta, you just have delta is, you know, absolute infinity, the height of the universe of sets. Um, so, so any two embeddings uh, from the universe of sets into some model of set theory have to be delta similar in that sense. Um, and, and the reason he posed this question actually is that he could prove that it was true assuming the Hod conjecture or a strong version of the conjecture. But it actually turns out that the answer is just yes, provably in, in ZFC. If you have any two models, uh, any two embeddings into the same model of set theory, uh, they have to agree on, on the ordinals. Um, so, so this is sort, it's sort of striking because it's, uh, it, it's almost what you need uh, to prove the Hod conjecture itself. Um, it, it's just, it's just not quite there, but, uh, but it, it seems like, you know, you looking at the Hod conjecture, it's completely unbelievable, but it's equivalent to this uniqueness property, which seems sort of tractable. And actually the uniqueness property can be proved in certain cases. So for example, um, this theorem implies, uh, I, I don't see why this theorem is is uh, weaker than than the part. I mean, yeah, no, yeah. So this theorem the is like part two of, of the equivalence. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I I was about to say. Um, so so in this theorem, and another question here: you are always assuming that M is a subset of V. Uh yeah. So that that's part of it. And J zero and J one are subsets of v yeah so so when i this is um the theorem is a theorem of second order set theory nbg um, so yeah all the classes uh you have the the comprehension axiom with uh, the classes as a parameter and the replacement axiom with the classes as a parameter mm -hmm. um, so that that's actually the the reason that this is weaker than the hypothesis of the previous theorem so that's a good question um so this in the previous theorem uh m could be very large the the ordinal height of m could be much larger than alpha whereas uh here m has to be a model of set theory uh which means that its ordinal height well has to be exactly the ordinal height of v so this theorem uh, implies uh, this second uh, bullet point here exactly in the case uh, where I guess um, that the height of M is alpha. And um, well, there are two ways you could say it. You could say that uh, if you add J0 and J1 to V alpha, you have ZFC for that structure. So you don't kill the replacement axiom. Or um, you could just say that alpha has uncountable cofinality. So, so in that case, uh, the second disjunct is true, which is actually maybe more important than the second order thing uh, if you have uh, philosophical problems with classes. So the, this, this theorem is a second order fact, but you can also just view it as the statement that if you have uh, some ordinal alpha of uncountable cofinality and you have two embeddings from V alpha into some submodel of V alpha, then they agree on the ordinals. I guess um they still be different, J0 and J1, even if they're real null ordinal. Yeah, so I, I guess I should have said something about that. It's um if you do um, the it's called Kunin Paris forcing, uh, so the the Easton product of just adding Cohen subsets to inaccessible non molo cardinals below the first measurable, then you produce all these different normal measures on the first 
measurable. So that was how it was proved that the first measurable cardinal can carry two to the two to the kappa many normal measures. Um, but the thing is, if you look a little harder at that model, you'll see that many of these normal measures actually have the same ultra power. So if you have two distinct normal measures, but the ultra power of V by the normal measures are equal, you'll exactly get two embeddings from V to M, which are different. Uh, if, uh, if two embeddings are equal, then their, uh, then their normal measures have to be the same. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes, then. Yeah, so, so that shows also that no large cardinal axiom can, um, can imply that any two embeddings uh, into the same model have to be equal. Um, okay, but if V is equal to Hod, then actually this theorem immediately implies that any two embeddings uh, from V into the same model have to be equal, because if elementary embeddings agree on all the ordinals, they have to agree on all these sets because they're definable basically from, from ordinals, second order, definable, whatever, from ordinals. So agreement on the ordinals implies agreement on all of Hod. So if V is equal to Hod, you get actually the full uniqueness of elementary embeddings. On the other hand, uh, above the least extendable cardinal, you can actually prove the uniqueness of elementary embeddings. Um, so if you have two embeddings from V into M and their critical point is strictly above the least extendable cardinal, then they're equal. It's a little strange because um, you can always do these weird um, East enforcings um, and kill this at the least measurable cardinal. And, and yet somehow above the extendable, that, that becomes impossible. Um, so it's sort of this, this Hod-like behavior of V that happens right above the first extendable, uh, analogous to the Hod conjecture in some sense. And it involves actually proving a, a variant of the Hod conjecture for a generalized version of Hod. So that uh, generalized version of Hod is called HCD. I guess that it, for the computer scientists left in the audience, I haven't even said what Hod stands for. Um, but uh, HCD is something called hereditarily completely definable sets. So the, the difference is here, instead of uh, iterating second order definability, you also allow access to an arbitrary kappa additive measure. So the, the kappa completely definable uh, subsets of M are the second order definable subsets of M uh, that allowing uh, parameters in M and also a predicate for some kappa additive measure on M. So, so for each, I mean, it's sort of hard to read the quantifiers here. So for each kappa additive measure, you can look at all this, the set second order definable over M using that as a predicate, and then uh, take the union of all of those ranging over all the kappa additive measures and you get the kappa definable subsets of them. Uh, th the idea is that um, kappa additive measure on M is sort of like a distribution on M or a random element of M. So you're allowing not only access to parameters in M, but also access to these generalized or idealized elements of M, kappa additive measure. So it's the idea that uh, an ultra filter on a set is uh, a generalized element of the set. Okay, so HCD of kappa is the result of iterating the def kappa operation. L and HCD is the intersection of all the HCD kappas. Um, so, so if there's an extendable cardinal, then um, any two elementary embeddings from the universe of sets into the same model agree on HCD. Actually, uh, you don't really need an extendable cardinal here. All you need is that the singular cardinals hypothesis holds uh, for a tail of singular cardinals. Uh, but extendable cardinal will do. And then um, 
other thing is, well, this uses the fact that uh, if you have uh, an extender embedding, right, then if you take a sufficiently complete uh, measure, uh, then J, any element, the elementary embedding applied to the sufficiently additive measure is just pushing the measure forward. Um, and that means that if you have measures uh, on, that means that the, the action of J on a measure only depends on the action of J on the underlying set of the measure. And that means that if you know that uh, J agrees on a structure M, uh, J0 agrees on a structure M with J1, then it actually has to agree on the kappa definable subsets of M for a sufficiently large kappa. So you can just by transfinite induction show that J agrees on HCD kappa for a sufficiently large kappa. So they agree on HCD. Now, uh, other theorem that's required in proving this uniqueness theorem is that if there's an extendable cardinal, then HCD is a ground of V. The way this works, well, one way to kind of see it is that you can prove if, um, if kappa is a strongly compact cardinal that HCD kappa is, um, is a ground of V. It's not gonna say how that works, but then the HCD kappas uh, as kappa increases are a shrinking sequence of grounds of V. And so Usuba's theorem implies uh, that the that sequence has to stabilize by the first extendable cardinal. So this is uh, extremely closely related to Usuba's theorem. Uh, they, they have to eventually stop changing because uh, otherwise the, the mantle couldn't be a ground. Anyway. The, the proof, so if you want to do it from just an extendable cardinal, the proof I'm sketching needs an extendable cardinal and a proper class of strongly compact cardinals. But actually, if you imitate the proof of Usuba's theorem, you can prove this theorem from just one extendable cardinal. Um, and then if you combine these two theorems, you get this uniqueness theorem for elementary embeddings because, uh, well, the point is if you have two elementary embeddings and they agree on a ground of V, which is a ground for a forcing that has size less than their critical points, then they have to be equal. That's, um, that's part of the lady solovey theorem I mentioned before. So two embeddings that agree on a ground of V for a small forcing with respect to their critical points must be equal. Um, and, and that means, uh, well, since HCD has to be actually a ground of V for a forcing of size, uh, roughly two to the kappa, where kappa is the least extendable cardinal. Uh, any two embeddings whose critical point is above the least extendable cardinal, well, their critical point is has to be above the first measurable, or at the at least the first measurable above the first extendable, so it's bigger than two to the kappa, and so they they have to agree uh, on that ground HCD, and so they have to be equal by the lady solovey theorem. So these two, two facts uh, you can be combined to, to prove the uniqueness of um, beddings above an extendable. Uh, and I want to make the point that um, this proof is using all these um, facts about grounds and forcing. So it's using Usuba's uh, downwards directed grounds theorem and stuff like that. And, all these techniques from set theoretic geology to prove a statement that has no reference to forcing in it whatsoever. Um, so that's uh, I think I think this is the first application of set theoretic geology outside of proving things about forcing. Um, okay, so now. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Do you get that HCD is the mantle or not? No, HCD isn't the mantle uh, because it's closed under ordinal definability and the mantle uh, doesn't have to contain hot. Okay. So a HCD can be much bigger than the mantle. Um, okay. 
So, so uh, one, one thing you can do is, um, well, I, I don't want to. Um, the mantle satisfies though. You get the mantle satisfies V is equal to HCD, which is kind of interesting. I mean, you get that uh, it, from an extendable cardinal plus the ground axiom, uh, you, you can conclude that HCD holds, which is sort of a uh, weird fact. It's sort of close to getting V is equal to hot. Okay, so, uh, oh yeah, I, I claimed that this was some version of the hot conjecture. I mean, this proves that that HCD is a large model. It's on the large side of the Hod conjecture. Um, so this generalized version of definability where you allow kappa additive measures actually gives you much more than Hod. And it's sort of interesting because this is saying that all these uh, sets are definable from arbitrarily complete measures. So the, the measures are, are way up high and you might think that they can't really affect because they're so additive, they can't affect the sets down below, but actually they allow you to define um, well, almost everything. So you're, you're like, um, you're witnessing that uh, cardinals above the least extendable, um, you're correctly computing all the cardinals above the least extendable using these objects, these measures that are way up above. Um, that, that seem like they are trivial with respect to kappa sequences where kappa is the extendable. Um, anyway, the uniqueness theorem uh, for elementary embeddings involved the, the assumption that the critical point is strictly above the least extendable cardinal. Uh, and the, the proof of the optimality of this theorem shows that this weird looking assumption is actually necessary. So that's the last thing I wanted to say. Uh, it, it's consistent that um, that you can have distinct embeddings from the universe of sets into the same model of set theory. This critical point is exactly the least extendable cardinal. So, um, so this use of an extendable cardinal is again optimal. Um, yeah, and, and the way you prove that it's just uh, the statement holds in the model that witnesses the optimality of Usuba's theorem, because as I said, that model is constructed in the last step by doing this east enforcing and the east enforcing preserves the extendable but also the the east enforcing is exactly what Kuhn and Paris used to build their model which has these two distinct embeddings uh, uh, into the same model. Okay so that's um that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. So are there any questions?